his people said? Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you so much. Uh, this morning, I'd like to start our sermon time uh, with a little music. I'd like to sing for you. Actually, I'd, I'd love to sing for you. But instead, and much to your relief, I've asked Jordan to help me out just a little, just a little bit. Oh, there you go. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Jordan to play some notes, uh, some notes that, uh, that you've heard before. Uh, so she's going to play some notes on the guitar. They're, they're notes that will be classified notes of dissonance, notes of, uh, of discord, unstable notes. I want you to, to listen to these notes. You can close your eyes if you want to, but, but hear, hear them. Hear what she'll play. Notes kind of, kind of leave you hanging a little bit, don't they? There's, uh, there's something about those notes that that isn't quite yet, quite yet complete. There's a, there's an inner, inward, sort of a sense in our minds that that want to, want to resolve those dissonant notes. So I, I want you to to close your eyes again, hear those notes again, and then hear the resolve chord. hear that? That's, that's resolution. That's, called, that's resolution. I'm not a musician. I do play the drum. I'm not a musician, but that's, that's a chord of resolve. And, and all those notes that were kind of hanging up there, waiting for something to, to bring to a conclusion, finally in that last chord, there's, there's resolution. And that's a musical example of, of resolution. And I think it's a great illustration because, because life is a lot like that. But life is a lot of dissonant notes, a lot of notes of discord, a lot of things that happen, pain, suffering, brokenness, whatever it might be, and we yearn for, we crave, we deeply desire that there would be a final chord of resolve that comes. And that chord does come, and it lasts. It's the chord of joy that comes from God and from God alone. That's what we seek. We seek resolution, and we're going to find that today, that chord, if you will. In Psalm 126, our writer describes for us that resolve song, that song of joy that is given to the followers of God. We're going to read about this in Psalm 126 this morning. The song of joy the song of the disciple. We read today, once again, in our sermon series from the translation called The Message. You can find that translation in your bulletins. Also, it will be up on the walls. Hear what God has to say to you this morning, richly in His Word. It seemed like a dream, too good to be true, when God returned Zion's exiles. We laughed. We sang with joy. We couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people filled with joy. And now, God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives so those who planted their crops in despair will shout, hurrahs of joy at the harvest. So those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with songs of joy, with armloads 
of blessing. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today. As always, it brings to us a chord of resolve if we have ears to hear and minds to think and hearts to process. Lord, come with your spirit and attend to us in those ways. Speak to us and open our minds and our hearts and our ears that we can take in your word and find some sense of resolve, Lord. The resolve of joy. Lord, we yearn for you. We desire you. Even when we can't speak it, even when it's unspeakable yet, Lord, we have that desire. Lord, come now and inform us and fill us to the full with your joy. Father, I pray that you would forgive me for the mistakes that I'll make today. And please, Lord, wipe those things away in our minds. Erase them all. But everything that's true, good, and lasting, that's for joy in your kingdom, let those things, Lord, take root in our hearts for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and Savior, and all his people said, Amen. There is a... Certainly a word here, I think you may have picked up on it, that uh, is used over and over again that, that ties all the thoughts together of the psalmist. And that word is joy. It's joy. Or, or to be more accurate and more correct, joy! That's the right way to hear the Hebrew word in English. It's that kind of intensity. It's not a mild, sneak-up-on-you kind of a thing. It is all-out joy. So I, I hope when you, when you see this next, and you'll be saying this to your family all day today. You'll be shouting joy at each other in, your, in their face. That's a good thing, by the way. If you're going to scream something, you might as well scream joy, right? You'll, you'll hear that. But, but that's the intensity of the word here, joy. It's, it's meant to be that deep and that intense and that passionate. So hear it that way today. It's suggestive of a, of a cry that, that rings out. It's a, it's a roar of celebration. It continues on and on. You might not actually hear its sound, but joy is like fireworks being set off. It's like, it's like the space shuttle taking off. It's like, it's like the ocean waves pounding and pounding on the shore over and over Again, it's loud, and it's booming, and it's explosive, and it comes from a place that's deep, deep within a person. Deep inside. Joy. And it's not to be confused with happiness, although we often do confuse the two. Happiness is an emotion. When we're happy, we feel something good, that ranges from contentment to, to satisfaction, to, to bliss and maybe even intense pleasure. Happiness is caused by an external event, an external source. Usually results in some outward expression of elation. We might smile or laugh or dance or pump our fist in the air or say something like, yippee, or, or yes, or hooray. It's, it's good to be happy. It's good. So you're not hearing me say, don't be happy. I want you all to be happy. I want you to, I want you to be happy a lot, okay? Even today, I do want that. But I hope, I hope much, much more so that you would experience joy, which is something very, very different. You see, you see, where happiness is an emotion caused by things external, joy is a state of being. It's the way you are, shaped or reshaped. And it comes from something within. Where happiness causes an emotion or an emoting of feelings and expressions, joy produces an inward peace. Something that you yearn for and try to go after and chase after in so many different ways. Where happiness lasts for just moments of time, Joy continues, and it sustains. It's like, that, it's like that resolve cord that just keeps on, just keeps on going out into the airwaves. It's good to be happy. Please 
please strive to be happy. We don't need any more grumpy people. But let's not confuse happiness with joy. And let's not confuse today the pursuit of happiness with the pursuit of joy because they are two very distinctly different things. Psalm 126, today. One of the songs of ascent, they're called, made by the disciples as they made their way up Mount Zion to go worship God during the three festivals of the year. They sang these things as a reflection of their lives, as what it meant to be disciples of God on their way, on the journey with him. It's a song of the pursuit of joy. We're going to look at it here. It starts by going back in history. It's where, it's where the songs. It starts by looking back, back to what God had already accomplished, back to what God had, had promised would happen, and then how God delivered on that promise of what would happen. Look in verse 1. It says in verse 1, It seemed like a dream. It seemed like it. It seemed too good to be true. When God returned Zion's exiles. Okay, he's talking about here the return of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, back from exile in Babylon, back home again. That's, what he's, that's the return of the exiles he's talking about. I think most of you know the story. It's the story of the people of God. They had rebelled against him. They rejected their God. They went about their, their own ways. They forgot their charge as the people of God. They neglected the poor and the widow and the orphan. They rejected the stranger and the outcast. These are all the words of the prophets. They forgot their charge. They neglected their worship of God. They did. They replaced their worship for idols. They chased after idols of their own personal pleasure, their happiness, if you will, the things that they thought would bring them joy, the things that they could get at and find and feel with their own hands. They collectively, the people, they spit in God's face is what they'd done. They forgot his name and what it meant to have him as their God. And even though he sent prophets to tell them, to warn them, to call them back to redemption, even though he sent them, they said, no, we'll make it our own way. Like the Frank Sinatra song today in Sunday school. They wanted to say, I did it my way. The song of the idol worshipers. And so what God did is he gave them over to themselves. He said, this is what you want. This is what you shall have. That's the penalty for sin, by the way. You get more of yourself and less of him. So he gave themselves over to themselves. And they were taken away to a land full of idols, fitting place for them to go. They went away to Babylon, 70 years. You can read all about that in the books of Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles. It's all there. And you can find also God's promise of redemption and restoration, also given in Jeremiah and, and Isaiah, that he would indeed return them from exile and make them his people once more. The psalmist looks back at the faithfulness of God in that promise of redemption, because God did that. In verse 2, he looks back, he remembers, he says, We laughed, we sang out with joy, we couldn't believe how good you were to us, how we were the talk of the nations, he says, when you brought us back. Verse 3, how the nations all said, God was wonderful to them. We are one happy people, we're filled with joy, because we're his again talking about the return from Babylon here. But he could have been talking about any other number of things in the history of people, the history of God. He could have been talking about the return of the exiles from Egypt, if he wanted to talk about that. He could have been talking about the, the promise of, of getting to the promised land, if he wanted to talk about that. There are so many instances of, of God and his promises made, his promises of redemption kept. He could have spoken about any of those he chose in this circumstance to talk about the return from, from Babylon. God is a God of promise, promise made, promise delivered. And joy begins, listen to this, joy begins by looking back and remembering what it is that God has done. 
Joy begins by not forgetting his faithfulness. That's what Israel did. They had forgotten. Joy begins with not forgetting who he is. It's by celebrating the God who is as the God who always was. He is the same God today and forever. The Bible, as we know, is, is, is the inspired word of God. It's one comprehensive story about Jesus Christ from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation. It's all one story. God has never changed. He will never change. He's faithful. We dare not forget that. He doesn't change his mind whimsically from one day to the next. He is the same, always the rock. You can count, depend on him. That's why we worship, by the way. When we worship, part of what we do is we remember so that we don't forget because we're a people who want to forget and make our own way. We bow down to him. We open our hands. We pray to him. We say, God, forgive us for what we've done. Bring us back. Restore us again. We worship for this very reason so that we don't forget. We celebrate the memory so that we can use that as a springboard to move into the future. That's why we worship. That's what Israel had forgotten. They had forgotten how to worship. Joy starts by looking back. But it's also absolutely future-oriented. Always. It's both and. Look at what he says in verse 4. And now God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives, our barren lives, our lives of captivity to idols. Bring us back from that again from our lives without you. Bring us back once again that we'll shout hurrahs of joy at your harvest, just like you did it before when you sent the captives off with heavy hearts and then brought them home with songs of joy. Do it, God, again. Joy looks back at God's faithfulness, then it projects forward with anticipation for the future. God will accomplish all that he has set out to do. He always has. That's why remembering and knowing is so vitally important. It's his story. And his word, the Bible, has established this firmly. Please get to know it. It's all there. It will fill you as it fills me with a, a deep down sense of something within myself with a peace and a contentment that surpasses all understanding. It fills me with joy to know that we worship a God of faithfulness and a God of promise. His word speaks to it clearly. Joy is rooted in remembering what God has done, and it's in the hope and confidence of what he will yet do in the future. Joy is having the dissonant notes of our lives, the, the discord notes, if you will, of our lives, the things that don't make sense, that don't provide answers, and it brings them all together in, a, in one chord of resolve. The chord is struck, if you will, by God, as if, as if you were an instrument being played. When you say yes to him, the chord is struck. The resolve is there. It's his. He makes it so. This is our sovereign and faithful God. Friends, I, I've never experienced a time when I've said yes to God and failed to find joy and peace in that moment. I've never experienced that. In fact, I have yet to meet anybody, anyone, who has said yes to God and failed to find joy and peace in that moment. It is a certainty. It is an absolute. It's a proposition that concludes with the same answer over and over again. It is as inevitable as the sun rising in the morning. It is as certain as gravity. It's as irrefutable as one plus one equals two. And when I say that, it almost sounds like a cheap sales pitch. It almost sounds like a bumper sticker. It almost sounds too good to be true. Say yes to God, surrender to God, and have instant joy. It sounds cheap when you first look at it and hear it. What's the catch? There, there is a catch. There is a, this isn't cheap. There is a catch. 
There's a catch. And it's a big one. It's a big catch, but it's a very simple one. The catch is, you really have to do it. The catch is, you really have to do it. You can't just think about it. You can't just intentionalize it. You can't just take it in as a good, warm, fuzzy thought and think, wow, that's great. You actually have to do it. And that requires something that we don't like to think about. It requires us to to wrestle with something that we would rather not think about. It requires us to think about, namely, death. Death. Not our physical death, but rather the death of our willfulness, the death of our pride, the death of our ego, the death of the grip that we have on this world and what it has to offer, the death of those things. See, there, there's something deep within us that seeks resolve, resolution, and we often search for it in all the wrong ways. Most often by pursuing mere happiness. We become consumers, we become consumers of happiness is what we do. We, we buy, we purchase entertainment, and we sit in the moment of being entertained. We ingest culture, and we become happy for moments at a time by our culture. We drink to numb our nerve endings, and for a moment, we're cured. We eat to satisfy our depression, and for a meal, we feel better about ourselves. We take drugs to eliminate our pain, and so indeed, for moments of time, we don't have that pain. But when all those things are consumed, we need to consume even more. You can't stop. We must consume more because all of those things are merely temporary. They're temporal. They all run out. And when they do run out, the happiness is gone. It's like a vapor. It doesn't exist anymore. You've got to go buy some more. You've got to go consume some more of that stuff to get back some more of your happiness. But those things can never completely satisfy that longing that's deep, deep inside that seeks a final chord of resolve. It's not, it's not their fault. It's not entertainment's fault. It's not alcohol's fault. They weren't made to give final resolution, you see. They weren't made for that. They were only created that we might enjoy some of God's creation. They weren't made to be worshipped. They were not made to be gods that we sometimes make them out to be. They weren't made for that. Anytime I've experienced joy, folks, or someone else has expressed me their joy, it's never about consumption. It's never about consuming. It's always about having been poured out. It's always about something that comes out. It's never about taking in. I can't tell you how many times people have told me about saying yes to God and how they experience this emptying out of themselves and a, and a filling up of the Spirit. That's joy. I can't tell you how many times people have told me they've, they've gone to work in the name of God, for God, and they, they come away feeling something so different, so otherly, so not themselves, so emptied out, and so filled back up with the Spirit that they can't, exp it's inexpressible. That is joy. That's life lived for the gospel. That's life in the kingdom. That's joy. But it must be done. You can't just think about it. You've got to actually do it. When we experience joy, we're no longer consumers. We become givers. We become vessels. We become instruments, if you will, played by God. And the joyful life is like a, is like a cord that just erupts from in us, from within us. It just, it's there. So, so I, what would keep you what would keep you this day from a life of joy? Ask yourself that question. Why, why would you say no to joy? What would prevent you from having a life that shouts out the glory of God? Because there's no hidden secret to joy. It's all there. There's no, there's no secret recipe, okay? You can know joy. If you've never had it or if you've lost it and need to regain it, you can know joy because you can know Jesus Christ. There is the joy. Do, do you know this Jesus is the question. 
Because if you don't know him, you can never know joy. You can't. You might think you can. You might imagine that you can. You may chase after happiness and think that you've got this thing called joy, but you do not because that's, that insatiable desire never ends. That, that, desire, that, that deep down yearning never goes away. It can only be filled by one thing, and it's not drugs, it's not alcohol, it's not sex, it's not pornography, it's not work. It's God. And it's service in His name. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. In who? In the Lord. And he will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Rejoice in the one who made you. Rejoice in the one who supplies your every need. Rejoice in the one who completes his promises to complete you, who gives you motivation and power to serve him who strengthens you in every circumstance, who causes you to be content, whom we can know. This person is God. His name is Jesus Christ. He came for us and for our sins that we might be with him and live with him forever. This is joy. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for joy. Thank you that we can know joy because we can know you. Because you've made yourself know you haven't hidden yourself from us. You haven't been in a cave somewhere, Lord. You haven't hidden you're not hidden behind a cloud. You're not hidden under a mason jar. You're not in someone's cupboard. You are the God of all creation. You've made yourself known. It's clear, it's simple, it's plain, and we thank you for that. We thank you for your gospel message of truth. We thank you for redeeming all things to yourself, even us, even sinners like us, because of the cross of Christ. Father, thank you for your word to us that enriches and enlivens. Lord, we pray today for our church, for our family members, for the kingdom here.